Good afternoon, everyone. I'm David Goldwyn. I'm chair of the Atlantic Council's Energy Advisor Group and CEO of Goldwyn Global Strategies. Uh, it's our honor today as part of the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center's fireside chats to host Neil Chatterjee, the chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. We're going to talk today about COVID-19 and its implications for the energy system. As an important note, uh, today's event is off is on the record, and we're currently live streaming on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. We encourage you to post about what you're, you're hearing today and share it on social media. Please use the hashtag AC Energy or tag us at AC Global Energy. You can find out more about this event and other Global Energy Center events on our website, uh, on the Atlantic Council website, and on social media accounts as well. We're hoping to make this a dynamic and interactive discussion today. And we've got uh, several hundred people uh, watching and, uh, and you all have questions. So we encourage you to use the uh, question and answer portal. It's um, located on the bottom. If you're using Zoom, it's located on the bottom of your screen. Uh, and so submit your questions there and then I'll, I'll ask them. Um, uh, as I said, we're, we're really honored to have uh, Neil Chatterjee with us today. He is a veteran public servant. Um, he is a twice chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. He's in his second term now. He got confirmed in three months, which I think is a tribute to, uh, to senatorial courtesy. Um, he served as energy policy advisor to Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. He served in the House Ways and Means Committee and the National Rural uh, Electric Cooperative Association as well. So he's really seen the House, the Senate, in an independent, independent agency and uh, the rural community. So we're really, really quite honored to, to have him here today. And the, the purpose of this discussion is that um, with the advent of COVID-19, a lot of the issues we were talking about only four or five months ago, um, how infrastructure would keep up with growing energy production, how renewables would be integrated into the grid, how to match climate concerns and, and, and deal with the balance of federal and state interests. Some of those are still here and many have changed. Now we've got questions about how will the grid function? Um, how, what shape are utilities in? and how will the, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission deal with these changes and the changes to come. So, um, so there's a lot to talk about today, but first I know Mr. Chairman, um, you must have an official disclaimer that you have to make before you can say even a word or hello. So let me turn it to you to make that disclaimer and then we can begin the conversation. I appreciate it, David. Uh, thank you and, uh, and thank the uh, Atlanta Council uh, Energy Advisor Group. Um, really appreciate this opportunity. Um, and, uh, and there are a lot of interesting issues to discuss. Uh, before I get into those issues, uh, thank you for pointing out I have to keep my lawyers happy uh, and state that the views I express here today are my own. They do not necessarily reflect the opinion of my fellow commissioners or FERC staff. And as you may be aware, the commission's ex parte rules do not allow me to discuss any contested proceedings that are currently pending before us. And uh, with that now out of the way, we can dive into anything you want to talk about. Terrific. Well, really, the first question is, how's it going? I mean, you're you're trying to run the commission, and you know, you're a you're a, a husband, a father of three kids. Um, so, how are you striking this balance? How are you keeping business going and managing at home? Yeah, uh, look, it's a, it's a real challenge. It's a challenge I know is being faced uh, uh, by many Americans and many folks around the world. Um, so, we really are making a conscious effort to to keep the commission running as close to normal as possible. Uh, I think seven weeks in now, we have successfully transitioned all of our employees uh, in DC and around the country uh, to full telework. And so uh, we're going about our business. Um, you know, virtual meetings and calls have replicated in person meetings. We've had uh, a virtual open meeting. You know, we have an open meeting the third, thir a public open meeting the third Thursday um, of every month. And we were able to successfully do one virtually uh, uh, to satisfy the requirements of the Sunshine Act uh, for our April meeting, um, engaging with stakeholders, engaging with the regulated community, um, engaging with our peers at the state and federal level. So the full business of the commission uh, and my responsibilities as chairman are still there, but I've had to take on additional responsibilities. Uh, I have three kids at home, a middle schooler and two elementary schoolers, and I am now responsible for teaching civics, math, music, and physical education. Uh, I can tell you uh, that particularly when it comes to my seventh graders math, uh, that is probably more challenging than oversight of uh, the reliability of the grid or uh, competitive wholesale markets. 
Um, and, uh, uh, and there's just, um, other responsibilities. Uh, I, uh, this weekend, uh, took on the role of barber. Uh, I did a suitable job for, uh, a, a web conference age. Uh, thankfully my kids are only zooming in their classrooms. So their classmates can't see the totality of, uh, of my work. Uh, but so, uh, as, as is happening in households all across the country, um, this is, uh, this has provided a, a lot of challenges. Uh, but we're all getting through it. My family is healthy uh, and we're together. And so uh, I consider uh, ourselves blessed. That's great. Great news. And maybe you can open a docket or have a technical conference on some of these distance learning practices. <laughs> with everybody else. Well, first, let me ask you about the state of utilities, because uh, utilities, like everyone else, are having to deal with uh, a workforce that is uh, that is getting sick, people that have trouble getting to work. Um, what kind of shape are the utilities in and what is the commission doing to help them keep functioning and delivering electricity to, to America. Oh uh, yeah, thank you. The utilities have really done uh, a remarkable job. Uh, utility workers uh, have just been uh, real heroes throughout this process. And uh, it's one of those things I think our focus right now is where it should be. We are prioritizing and, 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 and really taking great pride in the efforts of first line healthcare workers, our nurses and doctors, first responders, law enforcement, um, uh, uh, our grocery workers, teachers. Um, and so sometimes, you know, it takes a crisis like that for people to appreciate what they typically take for granted. And I have heard from a number of people that they're now recognizing in the midst of this unprecedented global pandemic, how important electricity is and how they're now more conscious of, conscious of the fact that were the lights to go out, the additional significant burdens that would place on the ability of families to get through this crisis. And um, it is now causing people to recognize how much effort actually goes in to the reliability of the grid and making sure that the lights stay on. Some of these utilities are going to extraordinary lengths where we're in a situation where most people uh, are working from home that can work. In, the case of a lot of power plant operators, they have moved home to work. They're living on site, rotating in ships, in many cases separated from their families uh, to ensure that they stay healthy and, uh, and the lights stay on. Uh, it's really, really uh, uh, patriotic and heroic. And I hope that when we all come out of this together and look back on the efforts that, uh, that these utility workers have made, uh, that they get their due uh, appreciation for uh, for the sacrifices they've made. Are you are you concerned? And it's, you mentioned uh, people at home are using electricity, but industrial demand is down. Um, are you worried at all about the financial stability of some of these utilities? Or is there anything you can do at the federal level if any of them are in trouble to to keep them afloat? Yeah, great question. Uh, maybe I'll uh, before I answer, I'll just take a step back and kind of walk you through how the commission has been operating the last seven weeks since we, we moved into this. As I mentioned, um, our focus has been kind of in three areas. The first thing we did right out the gate was um, we wanted to provide clarity and certainty to the regulated community, to stakeholders, to utilities uh, about their compliance obligations during the midst of this pandemic. We transitioned to full telework so did many of the entities that are subject to the uh, commission's jurisdiction. And we recognize that some of the compliance obligations that they have, they may not be able to meet them under regular protocols because things like face-to-face -face interaction could no longer take place. And what we didn't want was a situation where people were guessing, were guessing what you know, the commission might uh, accept what might trigger uh, you know, an enforcement action down the road. So we tried to put as much clarity and transparency to our processes and compliance obligations out there as possible. We also wanted to alleviate burdens so that entities could focus on their number one priority of keeping the lights on. And we have, and I've said it publicly repeatedly, um, we're not gonna second guess the good faith actions uh, that entities are taking to keep the, the lights on through this emergency. And we will use our prosecutorial discretion factoring in the conditions around this, uh, this global emergency um, and, and, and the application of our compliance obligations. The second thing we did is just keep the commission running. Um, and, I, and I just want to take a moment to really commend 
uh, the nearly 1,500 employees at FERC who have been working at full speed. Uh, and I think I've heard from many stakeholders, they have appreciated that um, the commission is, is, is running as close to normal as possible. And that's important. That's important for, for, uh, for stakeholders, consumers, the regulated community to know that, that we are open, we are transparent, um, we, are, we are trying to, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to do this, one of the reasons I was really focused on having a virtual open meeting, taking questions from the press, is it's important that um, Americans understand that what we are doing, that we're transparent and open about it. And I think just being open for business, again, something that we maybe took for granted, um, has provided a lot of uh, stability uh, and certainty to folks. Now, to answer your question um, about concerns I have uh, of, of, about what the impacts of this, uh, this pandemic will be on the energy sector writ large, that is kind of the third phase of what we are doing, which is looking forward uh, and, and, and what are the changes that are going to take place. As you mentioned, we have seen a shift from industrial load to residential. Many utilities admirably are, are moving to, to they're, they're not shutting customers off for an inability to play, uh, pay during this um, pandemic. Some utilities are having to suspend uh, just because of the practicality of this, you know, uh, upgrades uh, uh, to, to their systems. So I want to start getting people at the commission, uh, at, uh, uh, at the federal and state level, amongst stakeholders of the commission, and, you know, some of the brilliant folks that are hopefully tuning into this today to start thinking through what are the challenges we are going to face when we reopen, when we come out of this. What uh, are there going to be challenges to utility liquidity? Are there going to have to be planned outages? Because right now we're in the shoulder season. This is when a lot of the uh, you know maintenance work would be done. If that work is now shifted and when uh, it can resume, there's a surge in demand, but we have to have planned outages to account for that necessary maintenance. You know how are we going to to, to factor that? What is you know the the shifts in demand and cost implications going to mean for different sources of generation? Right now, because of low cost, because of flexibility, um, uh, gas is being dispatched uh, at a higher rate. That's putting pressure on renewables, on nuclear, on coal. Um, and what is going to be the state of those businesses um, coming out of this? And could we see? shutoffs, shutdowns occur as a result of economic pressures. And then when we reopen, see a surge in demand and potentially have threats to reliability. These are all real questions. They're serious questions. And I want to start thinking through and talking about these things now so that we're not reacting when, uh, when the country uh, inevitably reopens. Makes good sense. In fact, one question that's come in already asks about California um, with wildfire season coming back and people having uh, you know, less ability to, you know, to, to get out, even firefighters to, to get out to combat firefighters. Are you looking ahead to potential problems in California and the reliability of the system there? Yeah, I've been really uh, impressed uh, with my colleagues uh, around the country. Um, just the, 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 the communication that's taken place um, at several levels. We at the commission have done our part. We are uh, part of a uh, group run out of the Department of Energy called the ESCC, the Electric Subsector Coordinating Council which brings together um, not just uh, the utility industry, telecom, uh, increasingly banking with officials from DOE, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the Nuclear Regulatory uh, Commission, uh, state level leaders, um, and we've increasingly been bringing in public health officials, um, uh, CDC officials to help those of us who don't have an expertise in public health strategize for, for how to handle things. We've also been coordinating um, with uh, our state colleagues through NARUC. Uh, the commission and NARUC have partnered on a number uh, of initiatives. We're in constant communication uh, with our state colleagues, you know, getting their input on what they're seeing on the ground, uh, opportunities where the commission can lend its expertise or take action, um, or just you know, kind of staying apprised. In a crisis like this, open lines of communication are, are so, so important. And I've really been impressed at the federal level, at the state level, across government agencies, across sectors, uh, the amount of coordination that's taking place. 
That's reassuring. Let me ask you about um, talking to stakeholders in the age of uh, virtual communication. So clearly you've taken steps to protect um, uh, the staff and, and citizens by having these, these virtual platforms, but we've heard a lot about Zoom bombing and, you know, and sort of the reliability of these platforms, and also some concerns that there may be um, entire categories of stakeholders who don't have access to the internet. So how are you thinking about whether you all are doing uh, as good a job as you can in reaching everybody who needs to be consulted um, as you go through your continue to do permitting decisions? Yeah, I think uh, uh, stakeholder input, making sure that people's voices are heard are important at all times. Um, I think while uh, it's heightened, the, the, the sensitivity to it is heightened during a situation like this pandemic, but, but these are issues that we are uh, always cognizant of. Well prior to uh, this pandemic, um, you know, I've been vocal about uh, my desire to help frustrated landowners who feel that sometimes uh, not only are their voices not heard by the commission, but you know, it is not a landowner's responsibility to track for filings and proceedings. And so I think it's incumbent upon us at the commission uh, as well as uh, project sponsors to do a better job communicating with landowners about what is happening, about what their rights are, about what their opportunities for mitigation are. And so we do factor in these things. Um, you know, we, we uh, uh, have, you know, prior to this pandemic, you know, public sessions uh, where people have the opportunity to make sure that their voices are heard in instances where, you know, technology is not always readily available. So people can't um, access our website to find out what's going on. Um, we, you know, work with community buildings and libraries to have, you know, uh, paper copies available. Um, uh, and, and we put pressure on project sponsors to make sure they're communicating uh, with impacted stakeholders, that, that they uh, uh, do their part to, uh, to inform and educate folks on what's happening. Um, during this pandemic, where obviously safety and security is our number one concern, um, we've got to protect FERC staff, we've got to protect uh, uh, citizens, but we remain committed to transparency and public participation. Uh, so I think we've quickly adapted to using technology to allow stakeholders uh, to continue to engage with the commission. We did hold, as I mentioned, that virtual public meeting earlier this month. We held a technical conference via WebEx. Our administrative law judges are holding settlement conferences and hearings via teleconference. Uh, and we're actively engaging with stakeholders in other ways by utilizing the various communications technologies uh, at, uh, at our disposal. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, members of the public remain able to file comments in our dockets using the commission, uh, commission's website. So um, uh, we're doing everything we can to adapt to this situation and utilize the technology that's available to us to ensure uh, transparency, continuity, and, and that every voice is heard. Right, thanks. Hey, another stakeholder question, which is um, about consumers. Uh, you know, utilities have their, you know, their associations. So you've got, you know, all the large, large organizations are pretty well represented. But, um, but communities often, the consumers off are, often are not. Um, so how do you all make sure that you're hearing the voice of the consumer when you make your decisions? Great question. Look, uh, consumer advocates are very active uh, at the commission and in our dockets. And uh, we appreciate that engagement. Um, at FERC, we have to ensure just and reasonable rates. And that means that we have to strike a balance between consumers' interests in the lowest possible energy costs with the need to ensure that companies can invest in necessary infrastructure. So that's a balancing act, um, but it's something that we really, really strive hard to get right consumer advocates' filings uh, and their contributions to the debates that occur in our dockets really, really help us consider the issues that come before us. Um, and in addition to just participating in our dockets, uh, you know, staying in regular contact so that we're aware of concerns before filings is so important. Being able to have that frank discussion before ex parte applies, I mentioned the ex parte restrictions at the beginning, um, can really be beneficial for, uh, for everyone. And so we work really, really hard uh, to ensure that, uh, that consumers 
uh, uh, have a loud and respected voice in our dockets. Great. Uh, let me ask you a sort of a broad question now about the future of the grid, and, and maybe we can cover a couple of things. I mean, one is, uh, you know, you've got to think about diverse fuels. You know, a lot of states have renewable energy standards they want to build renewables in. Now that we've had this crisis, maybe you all are thinking about the importance of storage or resilience or crisis prevention in a different way. Uh, both, what's your approach and how are you thinking about how the future of the grid has changed as a result of this crisis? Well, let's take a step back and look at, you know, the previous decade, decade and a half, um, and the dramatic changes that have already taken place. Uh, you know, uh, you mentioned uh, in reading my bio that, um, you know, I started my career in the House of Representatives. We were working on EPACT 05 back then, and now 15 years later, the assumptions that we made when moving that major energy legislation, the last major piece of energy legislation to come out of the Congress, uh, you know, couldn't have possibly predicted the, the, the grid, the energy mix, and uh, the reality of the, the, the markets in 2020. So the grid has already undergone a significant transformation. We've seen the increased deployment of gas, uh, the falling cost and accelerated deployment of renewables uh, really uh, uh, advance uh, the grid um, with tremendous benefits to consumers. Uh, I think the markets have been very successful in uh, providing efficiencies, providing benefits to consumers, providing benefits to the economy, but also the environment. Uh, we have seen uh, historic reductions in carbon emissions in the U.S. power sector that are largely driven by these market forces. Uh, those have put pressure on traditional forms of baseload power like coal and nuclear, and uh, 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 we're having to, uh, to adjust for that transition. We're also seeing technology play uh, a, a pivotal role in the transformation of our grid and the move to a more flexible grid. Um, one of the things that I am proudest of that the commission, in action the commission has taken under, um, uh, under my tenure, uh, has been an order, uh, order 841 which removed barriers uh, to access uh, for battery storage technology to enable uh, battery storage to be compensated for all of its attributes in, uh, in capacity, energy, ancillary services. We are currently working right now, my colleagues and I, uh, on a similar approach to removing barriers to access uh, for aggregated distributed energy resources. Um, and I'm a big believer in competition in markets uh, and in innovation. I think competition drives innovation and cost discipline. And so um, many of the things that have taken place in the last decade, in the last decade and a half, we are already uh, uh, dealing with the, and, and have been able to maintain a reliable, affordable, clean and resilient grid. Um, and so I think in many ways, the energy sector um, has been prepared uh, for, for a transition like this, but obviously something uh, as unprecedented and uh, uh, as challenging as this pandemic is going to lead to questions when we come out of this. Um, I raised some of these issues earlier, and the reason I want to start thinking about them now is I don't know that we have the answers today. I don't know that we will have the answers uh, in the short term, but that's why I want to start thinking about it now so that we can be prepared when we come out. That's helpful. So just to pick up one of those, one of those issues, uh, how do you think about demand? I guess when, when someone wants a new project, they have to come in and show that there's demand for the, for the project. And I've, you know, part of some studies that, you know, had a pretty much, you know, straight path going for de demand for oil, gas and other things. Now demand is so volatile. Uh, so how do you deal with that? Do you, do you assume that this is short term? Um, will you change the kind of requirements you have for project sponsors on how they estimate demand as a result of this volatility? So there's no questioning, no, no question that social distancing and regional stay-at-home policies, which have closed many businesses, have reduced demand for electricity by anywhere from three to nine percent. This decrease resembles that of a snow day when many schools and businesses are closed and people remain at home. Uh, social distancing is also affecting intraday load shapes and generation dispatch. Uh, one example, 
Earlier this month, the New York ISO's monitoring ramp was as much as 18% lower in New York City and 12% lower across the entire New York ISO footprint. So over the long term, I think lower load forecasts could have uh, a number of impacts, uh, including potentially you have RTOs and ISOs and utilities that may cancel or defer transmission projects that are no longer needed due to lower load growth. Generation developers or utilities may cancel planned projects due to lower expected power prices or reduced capacity needs. Utilities requesting changes to certain rates or agreements uh, that use load as an input. Um, and so these are these are really thorny issues. And uh, this goes back to the balance that we have to continually strike between consumer concerns and, uh, and utility concerns. And so um, it, it's, it, it's a reason why I think not only do we need to all be focused on how to get through this pandemic, we've got to be ready for when we come out of it. A lot of questions uh, coming in over the wires uh, on LNG. Sort of, you know, LNG demand is, you know, is is weak right now. Um, a lot of uh, companies that are looking for projects, trying to reach FID, or trying to secure long-term contracts. From the commission's point of view, how do you how do you think about uh, the future of the LNG market, and um, how how will you think about um, how you make decisions for new LNG projects? So uh, I think again, uh, US LNG prior to this pandemic had been a real success story. Uh, I mentioned again, EPACT 05. When we were working on EPACT 05, we were envisioning uh, LNG import facilities, uh, the, the commission citing LNG import facilities in the US. We thought the US would be, uh, uh, even in 2020, a net importer. To think that we are now a net exporter of energy for the first time in 60 years is really remarkable. And um, I've you know, been pretty vocal that I think U.S. LNG exports have positive benefits for the U.S. economically, positive geopolitical implications, and that the United States being in this space uh, as an alternative to Russia uh, is, is beneficial to our allies, and a positive environmental benefit. If you look particularly at Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, where they're still today overwhelmingly dependent on more carbon-intense fuels, clean U.S. LNG displacing more carbon-intense fuels around the world would lead to a reduction in global greenhouse gas emissions. Clearly, uh, this pandemic is going to have an impact. It's impacting global demand. Um, we need to really think through and bring in foreign policy experts to see what what are the policy initiatives that are going to come out of this pandemic? And, and when it comes to trade policy and foreign policy, how will that impact uh, energy policy? Prior to this pandemic, in conversations that I've had with our allies around the world, in Europe, in Japan, in India, um, there was a real bullishness around US LNG, a real desire on the part of our allies to work with the US. Um, I think we have to anticipate during a global rebound, uh, a resurgence of demand. Uh, we'll need to see what those implications are and what role the U.S. will be able to play post-pandemic in, uh, in, the, in the LNG export space. But there are so, so many variables, um, many of which are outside of the bandwidth of the commission uh, that we're going to have to factor in. But we're having those conversations. We're bringing in uh, 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 experts in these areas to kind of preview where they see policy heading uh, when we come out of this. Helpful. Let me ask you about uh, about permitting because there have been um, you know a number of challenges in the courts uh, about permitting. Some are questioning the process of sister agencies um, and how they do their business. Um, some are talking about the adequacy of of review. Uh, let me ask you about the lead agency role first. You know, so you're what FERC is the lead agency, and you. You shepherd all the other agencies in line to do their work. Uh, a number of the courts have um, have vacated decisions of some of your sister agencies essentially for not doing their homework the way the, the courts believe that it, it should be done. Um, is there a role for FERC as the lead agency in providing more rigor or better discipline or something else to 
uh, improve the that process, or is that something where uh, essentially you, know, you have just have to rely on your sister agencies to to, to do the work that's the way it's supposed to be done? So uh, there's always ways that we can work to do things better and more efficiently and more effectively, and we've tried to do that at the commission. Look, our process is not easy. Uh, it is not inexpensive. Um, we we go through a, a rigorous review, safety considerations, environmental considerations, landowner considerations, um, uh, and uh, I think that uh, project applicants have a sense that uh, if they have a lawfully submitted application that can get through our process, they have the confidence that it is likely to withstand legal scrutiny, and that certainty is so important. There are always things that you can do better. Um, one of the things that we did in the LNG space, I mentioned, um, you know, the the real success story prior to this pandemic that U.S. LNG exports had, uh, had been in the permitting process. We were able to uh, approve twelve. LNG export facilities in, in, in a little bit more than a year in the past year. Um, and a lot of that was because we were able to come to a memorandum of understanding with uh, our partner agency at PHMSA, uh, the Pipeline Hazardous Material Safety Administration. We had just identified some areas where there was duplicative regulation um, and a lot of red tape, and we were able to, to cut through that, work out this agreement with PHMSA to streamline and better align our processes without sacrificing safety or compliance. Um, and so I think there are always opportunities like that to, uh, to, to, to find ways to, uh, to improve your process. Uh, but I do think the, the commission does do a, a good and, and rigorous job uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, support uh, uh, our current process. Right. That's with respect to the work that your staff does in processing the applications. But I guess my question is a little bit more about the other agencies, you know, so you've got, you know, sometimes, you know, eight or nine other agencies, FIMSA, you mentioned there, um, but there, there are others. Um, and a lot of it revolves around, around NEPA, uh, you know, sort of how good is the NEPA analysis? How solid have they considered it? Is the right agency doing the, doing the review? Um, you know, for, for those who don't know what it's like to be a lead agency who are on the outside, um, how much, you know, control or influence do you have on the standards? of other agencies and how they do the work in order to comply with FERC's deadline? Our staffs, our experts are in constant communication uh, with their counterparts across these uh, various agencies. Um, and, uh, you know, um, uh, I'm, I am confident uh, in the ability of our experts working with experts across the government uh, to, keep, uh, to keep the process moving. We do run into challenges. A lot of the challenges that are taking place are taking place at the state level right now, not necessarily across uh, sister federal agencies. I think FIPSI and other entities have done a pretty good job of, uh, of, uh, of in the uh, aftermath of FAST 41 uh, in, in having better coordination and uh, uh, adding efficiencies. Um, and so I think uh, um, our experts will continue to, to work with experts across the government on these matters. Well, a couple of questions about the uh, the minimum uh, offer price rule, um, uh, which is uh, has gotten a lot of publicity. And I think the um, you know there are a variety of questions. I think first it'd probably be helpful if you can explain maybe first just what you know, what is the commission trying to accomplish in this rule, um, and then because um, I guess PJM now has its view, and uh, and other states may have their views also. Um, how are you uh, first? What are you trying to accomplish? And then second, how is your process make room for, uh, for both um, uh, the other you know, regional organizations, but also other states to have their voices heard and have their views considered in this process? Yeah, it's, it's an extremely complicated and difficult area. Um, and two things that I care deeply about, uh, about uh, and support uh, have basically just come to loggerheads. There's been a collision. I care deeply about, look, I'm a conservative. Uh, I believe in states' rights. I believe in the ability for states to make decisions about their local energy future and their energy generation mix. I also, as I mentioned earlier, am a big believer in markets. And I think uh, Americans have seen tremendous benefits. Consumers have seen tremendous benefits from these markets. What has been happening, and I have to speak about this at a high level because we still have a compliance filing before us and, and other actions. Um, but what is essentially happening at a high level is that states are taking actions 
uh, by putting forward subsidies to prop up their preferred sources of generation. And those subsidies are distorting the price signals that are being seen across the markets and, and are really threatening the, the efficiencies and the viabilities of the markets. And so what we did in a fuel neutral way was we tried to level the playing field and counteract the impact that subsidies were having in these markets. Now, there have been a lot of people that are concerned that this will favor certain types of generation, that it will hurt types of generation. A lot of the angst um, has come uh, from people who believe that this will be a deterrent uh, to the increased deployment of renewable energy and for states to meet their renewable power goals. I actually don't think that'll be the case. Um, I'm a big believer in renewable energy. I'm a big believer in the business case for renewable energy. I think renewables have matured to a point now. I think there's no question that at their onset, growth in renewables was driven by subsidies and by regulations. I think we're at a point now where renewables can compete on their own without the benefit of subsidies. And I'm optimistic that because of innovation, um, because of participation in markets, because of actions the commission is taking to remove barriers to entry, that the cost of renewables is going to continue to decline and that in the future, renewables will be able to compete without subsidies. Uh, and so we think that levelizing the playing field, having accurate price signals uh, is, uh, is good public policy. And that is the underpinning that is underpinning the actions that the commission took. So just so I understand the math, I mean, because you have all these state level incentives that you've talked about, but there are federal incentives as well. So in a world where, say, you know, you've still got the, you know, the production tax credit, the investment tax credit, uh, or even a world where you had a carbon tax, would all those things be considered essentially costs that had to be borne by projects that should be therefore also optimized? So, so uh, I want to be very clear, the, uh, the, the MOPR that we put forward in PJM does not uh, apply to those federal subsidies. That was the, the will of Congress. And the commission didn't feel it was within our statutory authority to override the will of Congress when it comes to those federal subsidies. Okay, so that's that's helpful. And similarly, just one other thing I want to point out because I think it's it's important, uh, and and I just want to because these things are so complicated, uh, it's not necessarily uh, always well communicated, and I'm guilty of that uh, in part. Um, one thing that we clarified in our rehearing order of the PJM Moper decision that was very important to me was that voluntary rec transactions do not trigger the MOPR. Our focus was on addressing the impacts of state subsidies, not voluntary private investments. And I think that's a good example of, we were able to clean that up on rehearing um, uh, and, and keep the focus on, on subsidies and not those voluntary private transactions. And just in terms of the process going forward, PJM has put forward their compliance filing and other states may, may want to be heard. I guess they're, you know, states are figuring that they want to stay in these regional organizations should they get out of them. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about what's the process going forward? Are there, are there opportunities for states and others to be heard? And is this, is this on a slower track because of COVID-19 and it's harder to get people to get their views in or, or is it on a, the same track as before? No, we're, as I mentioned, we're trying to keep the, the, the commission running as close to normal as possible. We're trying to adhere to, uh, to the timelines that, uh, that we had envisioned. We do have to get the compliance filing out. Um, I never make predictions on timing um, or projections, uh, but we are working towards it. Um, some states have come in, the, the state of Ohio came in and asked uh, uh, for more time. Um, we, uh, it was a protested request for extension, so we kind of, uh, 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 split it and, uh, and, and gave a middle ground course um, to try and keep things online, but also be cognizant that, uh, that, that the state asked for more time. States are uh, uh, within their rights to, as that deadline approaches, come in and ask for uh, another extension. And so um, I think we can successfully balance getting our work done on the timeline that it needs to get done. You know, we want to get the auction schedule going. We want to be able to provide uh, you know, that clarity that, that stakeholders have been clamoring for for some time now. Um, and I also want to speak to this idea that, you know, certain states are, are frustrated and may want to uh, withdraw from the capacity market. 
Um, and my message there is let's see how this plays out. Um, you know, PJM's independent market monitor um, has uh, uh, been pretty vocal that uh, uh, and supportive of uh, the MOPR construct and the approach that the commission has taken and does not believe that it will have the cost implications or negative impact on renewables that some people are fearing. And so let's see how the process plays out. Let's see how the, uh, the, the first couple of auctions go before we make a judgment on how this policy will ultimately unfold. Okay, thank you. Let me ask you a little bit about the um, sort of the climate debate within the commission. I mean, we've seen um, uh, sort of uh, debates about um, how much of the climate impacts of new infrastructure sh- proposals ought to be calculated in advance, whether they should be calculated in advance, how they should be calculated, or in what circumstances, if there's a power plant on the end of the pipeline, or or if there's if there's not, and then um, some of these uh, some of these decisions have been are contested in the courts and are still in process. Can you give us a little bit of a snapshot about you know sort of where the conversation is in the the commission, and then what the calendar looks like in terms of what the courts may do in the next six months to a year? So uh, let me start by saying, uh, look, I'm a Republican from Kentucky, from the heart of coal country. I believe climate change is real. I believe man has a significant impact and that we need to take steps to mitigate emissions. Uh, I think where the disagreements come are over our statutory obligations and our approach to emissions reductions. I have tried to focus my genuine desire to mitigate emissions uh, and and, and combat the effects of climate change on markets. Um, I think markets here in the U.S. have successfully demonstrated that we can squeeze carbon out of the power sector because of markets, because uh, consumers are demanding, costs are falling, markets are working, and, uh, and we're successfully squeezing carbon out of the U.S. power sector. I think actions that we took on storage, on generation interconnections, that we may take on aggregated distributed energy resources are the types of things that will drive innovation and cost discipline that I think will have a positive effect on uh, the climate. I don't think it's hyperbolic to say that we may look back 10 years from now and say that FERC order 841 was the single most significant government action that was taken to to, to really uh, combat climate change because I do think that battery storage technology, particularly battery storage, uh, if we can get that technological breakthrough co-located with solar, could fundamentally alter the way that we generate, distribute, and consume power in this country. And so that kind of innovation-based, market-based approach, I think, has been successful in the U.S. One of the reasons uh, I was bullish on U.S. LNG exports is I think the conversations that we've been having with our allies around the world aren't just about commodities. So when I've met with our counterparts in India, when I've met with our uh, counterparts in Hungary and the Czech Republic, um, what they're asking about is they're interested in partnering with the U.S. on LNG, but they also want to learn from FERC, from our expertise in markets, to learn what's working, what's not working, what the challenges are. There's a real interest in liberalizing markets around the world because people have seen the benefits to the economy and the environment in the U.S., and they want that approach globally. And I think that approach not only benefits the U.S., not only benefits our allies, but benefits the planet as well. Um, Where the disagreements have come in the commission, you know, uh, I was proud of the fact that in getting the agreements move forward to start getting these LNG export facilities uh, permitted, um, the commission was was 2-2, Republican, two Republicans, two Democrats, uh, and we were able to come to a bipartisan agreement with my former Democratic colleague on how to account for the direct greenhouse gas emissions of the LNG facilities that we were evaluating in our project approvals. That was a pretty significant step forward, and that took bipartisan compromise, uh, and I'm proud of that. Where the disagreements have come, you know, in the gas space, it's simply one about, it's a disagreement on what our statutory authorities are under the Natural Gas Act. And there's just a disagreement on the commission right now where the majority doesn't believe it is within our statutory purview to do this sort of type of analysis and that major changes to our process need to be directed by Congress uh, and not done unilaterally by the agency. 
So a market question has come up. Um, so if uh, if it essentially asks that um, if it turns out between storage and natural gas and growth of renewables that there just isn't a whole a lot of demand for coal or nuclear, um, is that a concession? You know, is that a, a market outcome that the commission can live with, or is that a concern for the commission? So again, we're we're fuel neutral. Um, uh, our primary obligation is the reliability of the grid. So what we would need to understand, and this is a concern that has been raised, is that um, with the, 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 the current pandemic situation, with the demand destruction that has taken place as a result of a complete shutdown of not just the domestic, but the global economy, if there are businesses that do not survive this, if there are sources of generation that do not survive this, and they're shut down and they can't come back, and then demand surges, it is our obligation to make sure that the grid rel remains reliable and affordable. And so that's what we will be monitoring in a fuel neutral way. We need to ensure that the grid can remain reliable. And if uh, the market disruptions that are arising as a result of this unprecedented global pandemic lead to a potential reliability crisis down the road, we need to understand that and be ready for that. Great. Speaking of thinking about it, I guess, um, Carbon pricing is, uh, has been a popular conversation at the national level, at the state level, and there have been some um, uh, requests for the commission to have a technical conference uh, on carbon pricing. I don't know if you've, you've seen those as a way of figuring out how do you rationalize things in a market-oriented way. Uh, is this something you all thought about? You want to make any news today and, and, and announce it? Or, uh... Uh, well, look, uh, the filing came in uh, the week of our uh, open meeting, and so I was focused on the meeting and the response to uh, the pandemic. Uh, I think uh, uh, after we got through the meeting, uh, we looked at the petition, obviously a diverse uh, coalition that uh, that came in with it. Uh, we noticed it for comment. Um, I think uh, those comments are due. Uh, I'll have to check with staff sometime in May. Um, and so we'll go through our process. We'll review the comments uh, that come in, and then I'll consult with my colleagues, uh, and we'll discuss uh, um, uh, what our options are. Great. Uh, question came in about cyber. So I'm worried about, I know the commission has been focused on cyber attacks uh, on, on the grid and uh, concerns about whether it would impact natural gas networks as well. Uh, but people are wondering over the last couple of weeks, you know, when in the era of COVID, is there, have, have these attacks been on the increase or the same or have they diminished? Uh, great question. And we have been working very closely with, uh, with our uh, colleagues at NERC, um, at DHS, at DOE, uh, to stay ahead of this. There's no question that uh, a pandemic like this um, pre pre prevents, presents opportunities for malfeasance for adversaries to take advantage of our vulnerabilities. I think the, the work that we have all done collectively at the, the government level, at the federal level, at the state level, um, and across uh, regulated stakeholders um, has prepared us well for this. I think we understand that the new reality uh, uh, is that cyber attacks um, in many ways uh, have become the warfare of the 21st century and that energy entities and energy companies are at the front lines uh, of this, uh, uh, this new form uh, of warfare. Um, the example that I like to use while uncomfortable is, you know, no country can match the United States strength militaristically, um, but if 20 Russian hackers could take out a substation you know, if a missile took out a substation, we would understand that to be a clear act of war and would know how to respond accordingly. But a cyber intrusion that takes out the substation could have the same security and economic impact. And we just need to, to, to better align our thinking to that new reality. And I think we've done a very good job of not just uh, um, preventing, but staying ahead of our adversaries as they adapt and this pandemic has not shifted that focus. NERC has been vigilant. The commission has been vigilant. We have an office of energy infrastructure security that is in constant communication um, uh, with our peers throughout the energy and security um, infrastructure uh, to make sure that uh, whether it's working with TSA to ensure the security of our pipelines, NERC on the grid, um, uh, we're working diligently to stay ahead of it. It's great. And I might give a plug for the new National Petroleum Council study, Dynamic Delivery, which has a special section on cybersecurity. Uh, the, the FERC was part of that. And 
and, and many others, which really looks at you know, ways the government can collaborate together uh, outside of the FERC's uh, domain uh, to better improve cybersecurity measures and work with the private sector. That's great. Uh, another market question on um, the, ca the calculation of ROEs, return on equity, and I guess the, the market volatility question is now that we're seeing such fluctuation in demand and pricing, you know, is there a, you know, a, a smarter, better way to, to make those calculations maybe linked to interest rates or something that's a little bit more liquid? Or is that something that the commission might, might give some thought to? That is a really, really fantastic question and is one that we have been discussing at length. Um, both in terms of getting our ROE policy right, um, as well as looking to the future and when we come out of that pandemic. We've taken a lot of steps um, in this space over the last several months. Um, some of it is still pending before the commission, so I can't speak to specific cases, but I can say at a high level that I think it is very important um, uh, for folks to, to, to draw in the necessary investment uh, to get the critical energy infrastructure we need in this country built, um, you got to have stable, uh, reliable, you know, ROEs. And so there's a couple of pending cases before the, the commission in which we're wrestling with that. We also recently acted um, and opened a, uh, a, 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 a proceeding on our incentives policy uh, for, for how we grant ROE incentives. And we sort of shifted our approach from a traditional risk-based approach uh, to, to a more, you know, kind of uh, uh, consumer benefit approach, a benefits approach that I think was, uh, was very well received by stakeholders. And so I think uh, to answer your question, um, I have a two-pronged answer. I think in the short term, the, the, the best thing the commission can do is to finish out our work in these areas, to finish the, the rulemaking on incentives, to address some of the pending uh, cases that are before us. So we provide that clarity and certainty in the short term. But I do think long term, we, we need to take a step back and, and, and evaluate these types of policies going forward post pandemic, and try and understand how the world how the energy landscape may be impacted and change as a result of that. Um, but we at FERC, you know, we are a quasi-judicial body. We are, are, are governed by our statutes and by the record before us. So for us to make a, you know, any kind of changes, dramatic changes to account for the impacts of the pandemic in our policies, we would first need to have a fulsome record to act upon. And that takes time. And so I think rather than uh, immediately saying, okay, the world has changed, let's completely rethink our approach to these policies, I think what we need to do is continue on the course that we've laid out um, uh, to provide that certainty uh, to stakeholders, to investment, um, to the folks who need to get these critical projects built, and then um, convene a larger discussion um, with experts on, on, you know, what are the challenges going to be? Um, what happens um, if, uh, you know, a, a, a TO or utilities credit rating is reduced because they're unable to recover costs that they've incurred during the pandemic. You know, uh, what happens if companies, um, you know, are facing bankruptcies? What happens if investment is deterred because of the newfound risk that is coming about as a result of the pandemic? Again, I don't have these answers today, but I'm wanting to ask these questions now because our process takes time we got to start thinking about it now so that we can be ready when we come out of this crisis. Great. Yeah, another future future question. I mean, you've talked about breaking down the barriers for distributed energy and breaking them down for storage. Uh, and, I, and a question's come up about um, uh, long distance high voltage transmission, HVDC, um, which could really transform the, the transmission of, um, of renewable energy. Um, uh, how are you all thinking about that as a, as a technology? And is that another area where uh, the commission could do something to break down barriers to, you know, to you know, ease the entry of that technology into the marketplace. Yeah, look, I'm I'm all for innovation. Um, we've had you know a couple of tech conferences on dynamic line ratings and on innovative technologies to explore these types of issues. Um, I think for me, uh, you know, transmission is one of those uh, rare areas uh, in Washington where there's universal agreement and support for getting these transmission policies right. Um, uh, I think we recognize the importance 
of modernizing uh, our, our energy infrastructure so that we have those bones in place to accommodate the grid of the future, a more flexible and, uh, and resilient grid. Um, one of my great uh, frustrations um, uh, is uh, with Order 1000. Uh, I'm a real believer in the ideas around Order 1000. I think, as I mentioned earlier, I, I genuinely feel that competition drives cost discipline and innovation. Um, and that was the, the underlying premise around Order 1000. I think a decade in, um, what people have recognized is that Order 1000 isn't delivering the results it was initially intended to do so. But I've come to terms with the reality that we have so much on our plates right now that undertaking a full rewrite of Order 1000 would be biting off more than we can chew. So I'm hopeful that there are other targeted ways that we can maybe make fixes to Order 1000, coupled with getting our policies right on ROE and incentives to put that framework in place to really get the transmission that the country desperately needs in place. Gotcha. Only a couple of minutes left. I wanted to just flag a concern because it's come up in five or six different questions in different ways. And it's the, uh, the question of how hard it is to, um, to have a level playing field in energy. You've got um, tax credits and th for things like renewables. You've got tax expenditures, accelerated depreciation in the world of fossil fuels. There's really no, no energy source, which is not benefit from the largesse of Congress, uh, as you know well, in, in one way or the other. So it's a very complicated to figure out a true market uh, you know, level playing field in a world where everybody uh, sort of uh, has a finger on the scale in some manner. So um, uh, I think not to, to, to make you answer that question at length, but I just wanted to raise that concern because so many people have raised it, that it's, uh, it's very complicated and you know, it applies to, you know, to coal with externalities and nuclear with maybe loans and renewables with credits and oil and gas as well. So uh, everybody has something. Look, it's, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and I, I wasn't being flippant, these are really, really complex questions. And I think um, when you factor in the staff here at the commission, uh, the staffs at the various RTOs and ISOs, these are some of the smartest lawyers, engineers, mathematicians on the planet. Um, and uh, they're working really hard to, you know, uh, uh, to ensure that these markets, markets function as efficiently as they can. And, but there have been dramatic changes to our markets. Our markets today don't look like they did um, you know, in their infancy. And we're constantly making iterative changes and improvements to these markets and we'll continue to have to do so well into the future. And um, I think uh, I would just ask that uh, you know, people understand that these are really difficult, complex challenges but there are a lot of people who aren't pursuing a political agenda or trying to favor one resource or another. We're just trying to get these markets to function to the best of their abilities um, and, uh, and, and, and are, are, are working genuinely and diligently hard to do so. Great. Well, we'll let that be the last word. I want to thank you for, for taking the time and coming in today to, to talk with us and being so open and, and candid. And I wish you and your, and your family well in the, the days of sequester ahead. Uh, I want to thank the audience for joining us today and, uh, and, uh, and for, for terrific questions that have come in. Um, if people would like to re-watch today's event uh, or share the video with a colleague, you can find the live stream archived uh, on the Atlantic Council's website and on the YouTube channel. And I also want to give a couple of plugs. Tomorrow, the Global Energy Center is going to have another uh, installment of its Energy Source Innovation Stream Series, where Jennifer Holmgren, who's the CEO of Lanza Tech, is going to talk about how carbon can be recycled into valuable and sustainable new products through Lanzatech's new carbon smart technology. And on uh, Friday at 10.30 a.m., um, uh, Rita Berenswall, um, the Assistant Secretary of Energy for Nuclear Energy, is going to talk about the nuclear fuel working groups, a new study as well, nuclear, very, uh, very hot topic among uh, the Atlantic Council aficionados and, uh, and the energy, energy uh, aficionados in general. So, um, so thank you. Thanks to the audience, uh, and stay tuned. Uh, stay tuned for more. Thanks.